Good morning and thanks for joining us today for CMO Town Hall. Uh, testing times, but still seeing so many faces makes us feel uh, we are doing something good. So yeah, good to connect with everyone. Uh, so just requesting uh, the first panel speakers to come up, and then Paddy will. Uh, yeah. Okay. You don't want them to come back. No problem. This is fine. <laughs> okay, okay. So, yeah. handing over to you. Thanks. So, yeah. so I'll just quickly wait, wait. set the context. Like, what are we trying to do here? So, I'm from the Clever Up Thought Leadership team. So, we are trying to create uh, properties, like a lot of fresh content related to CLB, retention, and how group leaders and digital leaders are handling these pieces in the market. So if you share some of the best practices, how you are managing things, how the team was managing, how you could able to successfully overcome, what kind of challenges you face, right? So if you give these challenges and these are the best practices, we will transcript and we are working on a lot of play books and white paper now. So we will transcript it and we will share it with the growth marketer. So ideally, if you see the target users who will be reading these articles, they are marketing managers and executives who are actually working on the acquisition and retention platforms, right? So 40, 60,000 people across the group, they will be reading this stuff. On this note, uh, we have been doing a lot of focus group discussion and these kind of thought discussions. Most of them were virtual. We just started doing physical and we make sure not more than 8 to 10 people. We always keep it 8 people to 10 people. So in a way, we facilitate, uh, we foster networking among the group leaders. At the same time, we also get some fresh leader content information. Right? That's what the end goal for us. Um, the most recent playbook which we released, I will share a copy with you. Uh, that was organized across uh, India, APAC, Meta, Europe. Uh, some 15 to 20 focus group discussions we organized and just because there across all the discussions. Uh, which was moderated by the Parliament, who is the same of I think. Right? So we published it and we are working on more pieces for the growth marketers to understand how growth leaders are handling. Uh, customer life and value, what other metrics are out there. Right. So that's the end goal. So I request everyone to share and help the market. So kindly excuse if the questions are pretty late because it, we want it to be really simple for the marketing managers to read and understand how we can adapt and the best practice are out there. That's the end goal. Right. So thank you so much once again for joining us. I will hand over it to Jasmeet. So <coughs> we will discuss with you. It's an open ended discussion, it's not like a QA day. Anyone can take it up and uh, after 30 minutes I will also join and I will add some more points to CLB. We will have uh, um, Swinga from UTH, she will also join in another 30 minutes and then we can pass it up and we can have a networking event. That's the other thing. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, what is the duration of this? Duration, this will go for uh, 30 minutes, okay. uh, followed by another discussion for another 30 to 40 minutes, then we all will have lunch and we will. That's all. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, hope uh, all, of, all of us are feeling energized um, <coughs> on this uh, long-awaited in-person you know, opportunity to meet after a long time. So I know I am. So thank you very much for being here on behalf of Clevertap. We welcome you to this discussion. Um, <coughs> so as Paddy, uh, you know, laid down the, you know, uh, framework. Um, in the last 12-15 months, we've all seen that you know the digital landscape has obviously changed quite a lot. It has facilitated uh, the need for you know, an overall in the way we plan and execute our digital strategies. Um, we've seen a lot of large-scale migration of users into you know digital. The habits have changed. Uh, the patterns of consumption have changed. And uh, what it has resulted in obviously means it has a lot of data has flown into our systems. And this data obviously has many you know, dimensions to it. And what is more important is that it's in real time, it's trackable, and most importantly, it, it is actionable. <coughs> a lot of the automation tools that are present today help you to action immediately, actionable data in real time to reach out and Talk to your customers. Okay. Um, we've also seen the emergence of new terminologies. Okay, like earlier we used to talk about companies born in the internet. Then we spoke about companies born in the cloud. Now we talk about companies born in the pandemic. 
And each one of them has had very, very different challenges. Uh, the last one, obviously, born in a very accelerated environment, uh, has to be adapting much faster, doing things uh, at some very, very, very crazy speed. Uh, also, new user terminologies like <laughs> offline research, online purchase, uh, buy now, pay later, you know, uh, throwing up a lot of new buzzwords. <coughs> But what these buzzwords actually represent are consumer habits. Uh, what are they now looking for? And we know for a fact that uh, you know the way consumers interact with our digital assets today, where they interact, where they come in, what they do with it, and how they go out of it becomes very, very important. So using this as a you know, overall backdrop for our discussion, um, I would like to start off with <coughs> the first point, which is, uh, which is at the top of the funnel, so to say, right? uh, because that's where everything starts. Uh, we would like to understand from all of you is, uh, you know, what are the typical challenges now when it comes to acquisition? Because uh, we know for a fact that a lot of people are turning to online. At the same time, when you go for the acquisition, uh, you have only very few choices from where you can go, which basically results in, I would call it monopoly, but at least a duopoly or maybe best three, top three, you know, places where you spend most of your money. And therefore it pushes the pricing like crazy. So, uh, what has been the typical challenges for, and we have a very mixed, you know, uh, set of businesses on this table. Uh, we have pure play digital, we have uh, uh, hybrid, we have legacy businesses. So it will be interesting to get a perspective from all of you in terms of what are the acquisition challenges that you face in the current environment and uh, we can maybe do it, you know, kind of joke. So why don't we start with that? Why don't we introduce us in Hello everyone. I am Amitabh Vishnu, I am uh, Vice President of Marketing for the New Year's Group. So I, I hope I am audible to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, just meet, uh, I think, a very well put. And uh, we deal with the news business. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for us is that our product lifetime is extremely short. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's not a product that uh, goes on new purchasing. So when I'm saying product, a product would be a single news that gets released, which has a shelf life of maybe two hours today. Uh, then if there is a development in that news, then probably it has a longer shelf life. So uh, we have to keep coming up as a good deal and treat every news as a product by itself. So that is a very, very challenging task. Uh, also, we noticed that uh, there is a habit change that's come across generally in the public. Uh, your uh, mobile is loaded with apps today. People don't want to have five or six news apps. You know? And of course, you have uh, people like companies uh, like Google and uh, Apple who are trying to push their way through. Yes. And, uh, Bully them too. <laughs> you would rather be the right word. <laughs> so uh, the challenge is uh, also what we notice that it's become more of a search-based uh, environment rather than a. So if there is what for a um, flag that's happened at Bihar, people will not like to get into a website or an app, then search where that news is, and then go and go and read it. So it's more of this just like to Google or do anything, you know, that uh, floods in Bihar. They will come across first few uh, options, where, whichever brand recall that they have, they will go into that website or uh, and read it. So there's a huge, huge shift that's happened in terms of the way the consumption is happening. So this gives us with brings us with two different kind of challenges where we are actually focusing strongly on. And I think many of us would be facing similar challenges. 
Uh, one is uh, how to have that brand record and this be of course on the first page, search page, that is of course there with everybody. And uh, how to have that brand record, number one. Number two, how to increase the engagement on a real-time basis once the user is there in your environment. So, uh, to engage the person who's come into your environment requires you to actually know the user extremely well before he enters your environment. And that is something that uh, uh, that we are focusing on and uh, that is what I think, uh, thankfully AI is helping us quite a bit. So that is uh, what I think, uh, that's that's the challenge and that is the so, so what are your main avenues of acquisition? Where do you go? Uh, okay, so we are not uh, heavily, we are uh, primarily on uh, organic uh, growth. Okay. We are primarily on uh, organic growth. Uh, so your existing readers come to your digital assets or you acquire... So, uh, okay, so our uh, new users are almost about 60 to 70, 62 percent of new users, 60 to 62 percent on an average. Uh, if we don't have uh, much of... Uh, repetitive users. That's because of the search base that I'm talking about. We've seen that shift that's happened. What we are trying to do is, uh, we're using a lot of AI, this thing to uh, understand our consumers before they come into our environment through AI, uh, classify them into uh, various uh, segments, and uh, deliver uh, news that is that would interest them, along with the news that we feel is important. So, so it's a mix of editorial and serendipity. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's a mix of editorial and serendipity. It's a uh, how would I put it? It is. It's basically studying uh, digital footprints of individuals beforehand and uh, actually serve them once they're in the environment. Yeah. So I mean, basically focus on what's trending, and then on obviously. Based on my interest, you will serve something else. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Hi, this is Satya. And I work in the insurance industry. And before this, I have had direct experience in actually D2C, e commerce, and a couple of other industries, including telecom. What is it? So, yeah, so the same question in terms of acquisition. Right. So I talk more from an industry perspective rather than a company perspective because uh, most of the challenges are all across. Uh, insurance right now is really like under three percent penetration in India. So uh, till you're small, you're all trying to be there, right? So the problems are very generic in nature. Uh, the challenge is multifold. First is I mean, if we understand what is the core offering of an insurance is protection. Insurance basically says that if something happens to you, there is somebody who will take care of people who are left behind or any, any, like if you lose property or life or whatever, right? And in a traditional country like India, uh, insurance is not the first thing that people think to hedge their risks. The first investment in a culture like India that people do is their children, because that is the old age insurance, that is the one that will kind of, and then the next is any other kind of property. And then maybe other financial instruments, and in the end, so it takes a very really woke customer actually to buy insurance and understand its impact. And it's a very, very important part of one's financial management, but it's not understood in that way. Which brings me to the second challenge, which is why is it not understood? Because of my many reasons for primary education. Education is not how much a person has studied, but how much financial literacy or how much understanding of finance is available in a structured way. Uh, for instance, like one of the things that's happening in US which I'm following is like Charles Schwab and Robin Hood and all of these companies over there have actually started financial literacy programs for school children and college boys and so that they can educate them of, of these things at an early age. But in India, we are kind of not there yet, right? So then most of the education then kind of depends on a face-to-face -face interaction because we are actually trying to educate a customer. Then whatever education we impart in the half an hour conversation, we we want the customer to use that education and then buy our product. 
It's like I try to explain you computers, and then after half an hour of kind of helping you understand computers, I am asking you to use that understanding to buy a computer, right? So it's a very high touch environment. So it's a very high touch environment. It's a very high engagement environment. But still, as I said, there is another fifty percent kind of penetration there. So there are people in the market who have what it understand it and kind of are out there. So the fight becomes for these people who are woke. I call them woke because they understand that why insurance is important, right? So then the fight becomes on these these these, these customers, right? And uh, more and more kind of so the funnel becomes that there are articles, there's content, there's physical uh, interactions, all of them working on this education front, pushing the customer into this funnel from where the acquisition actually starts. Then now the customer is ready to buy. But doesn't necessarily mean that if I have educated the customer, the customer will buy from me. He can go on and buy from anywhere then, right? And then the funnel kind of starts. And now to squeeze the customer out is not an easy task again because it is insurance. My simplest of forms might, I mean, simplest of insurance forms, life insurance forms, will have above seventy questions, right? So even to fill up a form, you actually need to have quite an amount of patience and dedication and commitment that yes, you are going to buy this product. So my primary challenge, my primary challenge in acquisition then becomes this customer education piece, which cannot be done in a bite-sized Google search or a, a YouTube video. It has to be very involved. So therefore, the search. And other media only work for people who already understand insurance, right? Or then there are companies who will kind of try to put in a scare tactic, saying, "Hey, we are insurance. If you are not buying us, then blah blah blah," and you know, so that customer actually triggers that education journey and starts finding about insurance. Now, because it's under three percent, right, penetration, everybody is vying for this market, and therefore the competition becomes intense. And after a kind of, and before that, I mean, different companies have different strengths. Some have very large offline teams. Some are completely online, right? So people who were completely online were kind of playing in their own territory. People who were completely offline, not playing over digital, they were kind of in their own world. And there was an artificial divide. After pandemic, everybody is on digital. So that has created an additional pressure on costs. So the cost of acquisition has gone up. And to make matters worse, insurance is a regulated industry. So, the commissions, the payouts, the structure of a channel, all of it is largely mandated by IID. That means it's an industry where all the costs are known. Like in mutual funds, faces a similar challenge as an industry that all the costs are known. Any mutual fund can only have X amount of money to spend and to acquire customers. Right? It's not that anybody can come in and pump in money and kind of get us. So do digital platforms like aggregators help you in your cause in terms of short circuiting that entire education and that adoption cycle? Any channel comes with their own cost and I mean there is no arbitrage is what I'll say. Everybody needs their compound of flesh and if some some something is actually helping out, then they also understand that they're helping out and they want that. So and if you look at it, uh, that's so that's an additional challenge for you for that. But then that channel is also then then it becomes that that channel itself like for instance Google is a channel for me right but is it my exclusive channel no I am fighting with other so it becomes the place where you are in a bidding war it's all awesome. then there are additional platforms that also are emulating what's happening on Google so how does it help I mean the competition the problem doesn't go away right it just becomes that now I am fighting at five different places rather than just one single place and so I mean uh, more or less that is where uh, some of the things that uh, that uh, also pause us is like uh, Google and Facebook have come up with tons of uh, new tools and messaging and you know uh, how we can communicate target. and communicate and yeah. not only target targeting is another challenge because so, most of the Google servers are not in India. I mean when you advertise, you can't declare where the the, the data will be stored. So remarketing is one challenge, yeah. right? Then, uh, in terms of construction of a message, uh, regulation mandates that the insurance message be classified and recorded. Right. So each marketing message that goes out, 
that is kind of declared so that if any customer comes back and claims that I was misinformed, they should be able to pull up their packages. Okay. That means I can't write 50 copies on this side and 50 articles on that side and permit it to come back. Mm. Maybe I, I can, but I mean, in the spirit of the law doesn't say. So these are the kind of things. So even if AI comes into some level, uh, the, and this is not just my challenge, I mean, other industries also are in the finance at least. So kind of, uh, that's where we are. Thank yes. Yeah, yes. yes, sir. Hi. Uh, yes. I'm my name is Sameek Sai. I am uh, from HDB Securities. I take care of digital initiatives and learning and development there. So, as uh, just like put out, uh, our the entire uh, digital account token journey was born in Thailand. We were a company which was uh, absolutely on the physical onboarding. And uh, the pandemic forced us, or uh, we were at this planning and taking, but we had to take these three steps and uh, launch the digital account token. Over time, we have uh, rehashed. Work of it, and today it's one of the finest journeys that uh, is there in the industry. It's not set by me, but uh, third party auditors. So, uh, we are taking uh, fast steps, uh, we are scaling up, we've already gone uh, quite a distance. Uh, we don't see a challenge as it is because uh, earlier we are, we are absolutely in a charter time phase so far as uh, comparing with our uh, previous uh, stages, but that's where we're going things like this. You have a problem in the very So many new investors have come into the market. Yes, so. uh, industry has seen flux after, uh, after uh, say, March 2020 because yes. uh, uh, where to, where to invest and where does anybody invest today? So yes. the stock market has been uh, benign. So a yes. uh, lot of theories have been crashed. Uh, there are theories that have been made mutual fund, and there are theories that have been made by the market. Everybody is uh, latching on to the equity bandwagon. Especially for the, for the youngsters, okay. and uh, and uh, so everybody uh, wants a clear cut uh, UX, and uh, they want the best of the journey, the best of the products, and they want to get down uh, to this immediately. So we are responding, we have uh, matched the expectation, we are uh, looking at scaling up. So that's all. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Thank you. So basically, you're saying there is an actual gap and. Uh, gravity towards a platform like yours, so acquisition currently is not a big issue with uh, it's the onboarding experience and other things that yeah. make it easier yeah. for users yeah. to come. To be inward looking, yes. The, since we didn't have the digital onboarding journey, yes. it was very tough. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There was a point in time where we were asking to be down to. So that, was, so that was a blocker to your acquisition. That was absolutely a blocker because oh. the pandemic hit at an absolutely wrong time for us. But we responded very fast and we were on on uh, uh, the right track now. Thank you. Good. Just want to add one point yes. to what you said. Okay. Good. So you mentioned about acquisition channels. So there's like a very recent report uh, from Kotak's chat person I got to it regarding their Q2 annual submission. They possess a certain amount of loss. But he is, uh, that is because of the fatality and more number of people claiming insurance that has actually, you know, they possess a certain loss for their people. In the same report, he had also mentioned that uh, there is a huge growth organically possible, especially brands that are having multiple portfolios. So then there is a, another dynamics to it that we are seeing. So, limited insurance technique, for example, from your like another report from KPMG says. They leveraged uh, AI and behavioral technologies, right? Like, and uh, from 98 customers to 250k customers within two two years, and 90 uh, percentage of their existing customers are really happy to recommend to it. So this is another report from KPMG. So what it is showing is it showing on another angle? Like we are having a lot of uh, you know like users in their database across multiple portfolios. Is it something like understanding their user behavior pattern and uh, you know like pitching the right product to the right set of users? Is it a way of organically? Because the cost of acquisition is uh, six times more than the cost of retention, right? Like uh, five percentage of retention helps in 
15 to 95 percentage of the profit, like again KPM this is according to the businesses, right? So when we say all these factors, uh, do you think like today brands like uh, major brands are they equipped with enough number of data? How are we handling the segmentation? Is segmentation really helping out in reaching out to the right cohorts? And is it uh, actually you know like monetizing? Are we completing the transaction? Are we you know like increasing the revenue? Like what is your angle? Probably you and from product you know, people can address it. <coughs> Very longish question <laughs> and. Uh, Pardon me if I take, I will take like around five or six minutes on this. Because you mentioned a lot of things and uh, a lot of those assumptions need to be corrected. First is Lemonade. Not only Quoted. If you will see Lemonade CEO, I think in 2019, published a very, very good article. Actually, for digital guys like me, it's euphoric. He mentions that Lemonade uses close to 1600 and uh, those who are not aware, uh, Lemonade is an insurance and a general insurance company from UK, which is very, which is at the forefront of digital technology. They use some 1600 data points to evaluate every single policy. Out of the 1600, they only take, if memory serves me right, around some 100 or 200 points from the customer. The rest of the data points are accumulated from the environment, from third party sources, and from TLA and everything. What is not known or lesser known is that when this report came out and he said, he declared in that report or that his article that insurance companies who don't go digital will not survive in this world. And then he went on kind of declaring everything about and what they are doing, which created a fear. Because according to his theory, if there is a, and I'm quoting, I'm kind of paraphrasing from the article, according to his theory, if in a house, if it's, if it's a Jew person who during Sabbath lights up candles, right, uh, they will be kind of, they will have to pay more premium because they are using candles inside the house that increases the risk at which the premium, uh, at which the house can be insured. While a person who does not light candles in their house because of their religious beliefs, they will be insured at a lesser risk. This created such a controversy because there is one place, one thing in insurance that everybody is very aware of, which is that I'm, insurance works on the theory that if I have a risk, but if I kind of 10 people help me mitigate that risk. But if insurance companies start selling insurance to only healthy people, for instance, or if we start using data to filter out people who are at a risk, is that actually insurance? Is the insurance company actually insuring anything? So this is called exclusion, right? Where companies try, where companies, and, and this is much uh, predominant in West than in India, because in India the regulator actually has the goodness of people at heart. And in that way, I will really praise the regulator. That exclusion is something that is rampant westwards, where AI is being actually used to exclude people from insurance policies. They are being, in the name of data, they are being charged for every single piece. I mean, if, understand, if your religious beliefs actually increase your house premium, home insurance premium, is that good? At what, at what place do we kind of draw a boundary? So, those are kind of, they go from business to academic to philosophical discussions, right? So, I just wanted to sensitize this group here that there are issues on, in use of technology in every business. It's not as clear cut that technology is good. Technology is a light that brings its own shadow, right? And I'm, I, I am in digital and my life depends on technology and then I'm saying this. So you can get a read between the lines, right? Uh, other things you asked, uh, can you repeat the second part of, I mean, uh, so you, you were asking about how data and how much data can be used. And, uh, so one of the controversies also it created was that if you have given me something, if you have given me your name, but I'm using that name to infer your religion, is that valid? My computer model might give me to a large extent that if a person's name is Jasmeet, he might actually be from Punjab region, from a Punjabi family, or might be a Sikh. And then my computer model might describe something else based on a study of this thing that Sikh people have XYZ features or XYZ complications or XYZ this thing. 
Is that fair? So there are a lot of ethical boundaries here, which Indian insurance companies don't cross, which is really, really what is remarkable. So we can go overboard with data in search of profits, but at some point that sense has to be real also. Yeah, as far as retention is something that we talked about, and I want to spend two minutes on that as well. Retention, CLVM, all of these are names for very old philosophies of loyalty and stuff like that. Consultants found new terminologies, we are okay with that. But loyalty applies to a certain kind of industry. Loyalty requires commodities. It works best in commoditized products. It works best over where there is no difference. Second, loyalty works best where the market dominance has been established or market penetration has been established. And therefore, the pool of customers is largely divided between customers, between companies. For instance, if you look at telecom, 1.2 million, 1.2 billion or 1.1 billion is the latest number. More or less, the entire market has been taken over. And now, the only way to attract customers is by not losing them. Right? It takes a different dimension. So if you look at the strategical stack that any company will follow, for a company like telecom or retail, loyalty is right there at the top. For insurance companies, yes it is. We call it as persistency. But it is more on that particular purchase rather than the customer. The theory is expanding now. Uh, other theories like existing customer management or you know. But in insurance, you don't get to talk to the customer. In life insurance at least. In car insurance, how, how much do you talk to the car insurer? Once, twice. <coughs> the car insurer does not have an opportunity to talk to you. People try to create those opportunities by creating additional pictures, but then at some place the creative wall comes in. That can you actually use? Can I actually use the data that you uh, have in Mercedes? Can I use the data to evaluate your uh, purchasing power and then use that purchasing power and that data to actually sell you a different product from my stable? Am I allowed to do that? No. Why? And this is regulatory. Because if I have taken data from you for one particular declaration, under one particular declaration, that means I took your data to evaluate your fitment for this insurance policy. I can't use the data for something else. I guess I'm making a record point that if come back to it, so I'll stop here because this is an ongoing thing. Yeah. And, uh, there are, there are, we haven't heard from the rest of the panelists, but, yeah. so, and, so, but yeah. there are many aspects to this. Yeah, okay. Go okay. Hi, uh, I'm Aarti. I handle the brand and marketing in Chicago. We are a technology to be a mobility startup. So we use technology in bus travel to make it more reliable. We are present in now more than 30 cities across uh, India. There's nearly pure to city where buses take the primary mode of uh, transport, everyday travel for people. Uh, with respect to products, what we have is uh, we have uh, we have an app that uh, allows users to like track their bus and see how, mu how much time the bus will take to reach their particular bus stop. What we have been seeing uh, in cities such as Chekopal and Jabalpur across cities in UP, the major pain point that anybody has, we all speak about uh, less of attention span, we all say how do we uh, get people not to skip the app on YouTube, right, after the 5 seconds, 6 seconds gap. The reality, one reality of India is also uh, this, that an average person uh, spends 30 minutes on an average uh, standing and waiting at the bus stop for the bus. Uh, while a lot of other mobility uh, transport systems have used technology uh, uh, and adopted it, buses unfortunately uh, over the period of years have not uh, enhanced technology. Uh, till now, especially for the user, uh, at the user front. Uh, so hence, the app there, which allows you to track uh, and see where your bus is. We also have uh, mobile products. You can buy tickets uh, and bus passes uh, uh, from the Jaro app. Uh, the, 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 when the person comes of uh, customer acquisition, for us, uh, digital becomes a key, uh, an important parameter because we are targeting the entire city and we are targeting people who take the bus. So who are those people who take the bus? They are people with uh, a lower middle class, middle class uh, background, young college students and young professionals. 
uh, we use handsets uh, targeting a lot to get customer acquisition. What our major challenge is, uh, because of the lockdown, also what happened, everything shut down, there was no bus on the road. So three, four months, nobody was traveling. All the entire uh, punji that we call of customers that we had suddenly vanished. And then uh, we, we, we had to develop different uh, retention models or different user journeys to map them and get them back on the app as the city started to unlock. And what we have seen is that there's a, there's a shift. There's a lot of users, uh, especially middle-aged uh, users, people with entry level smartphones, who were okay to use uh, mobile platform for information serving, like they were fine to see whether what time my bus is coming, I'm supposed to miss my bus today or not. But were not ready to transact on the digital platform. They were not sure, they were not uh, open to spending through their mobile phone or, or even a, a travel card for that matter. But with lockdown and with safety becoming such a huge factor and uncertainty of travel also, people are not really sure how many times they will to travel and when will be their next bus ride. And they don't want to exchange cash inside the bus because it travels from different hands and there's a transmission risk. We have seen uh, a lot of our audience just moving and adapting the digital platform. We have a lot of people uh, who are now ready to travel and pay a transact using mobile, using card. And hence, uh, our major challenge is basically how do we segment all these users, say people who are just here for to know when their bus is, to how can we get them uh, buy tickets or buy commit to bus travel for a monthly or retail uh, consistent basis, and uh, how do we target them? Like how do we make them keep coming back? So you are using a model of. Uh Hybrid, right? Yes. Using the bus stop, using yes. the bus as an agent. Yes. And then half an hour gain the information using digital for a continuity in their yes. experiences. Yes. Yes. Okay. Interesting. That's also because you are uh, operating in a very tier 2 or tier 3 type of market. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Michel. Hello. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Nishu Pura and I represent uh, Digital Marketing for Future Retail. So I think last 20 minutes, half an hour, I think we've got beautiful set of problems, honestly. Like, you know, one from the industry concern, from the insurance point of view, regulatory point of view. We have an issue of just consumer behavior, right? Like you come from a retail background, a bit of brick and mortar company, legacy company, 20 years, just all, right? But we are also a pandemic baby, shop.bizarre.com. Like, you know, had to be given birth to during the pandemic because people couldn't go to the stores. 70% of the stores were in the red zone in one point of time. So, we, before that, we used to run something as O2O commerce, which is offline, online to offline commerce, where we used to, this is pre COVID, right? We used to do it, but a very small little now, where we used to get people engaged online, but go shop offline. We have a complete technology in place, which is a distribution mechanism of coupons, and I can attribute on which, from which channel the person consume, engage, pick up the coupon, plucked it from there, to which city, to which store, to already buy with that one ticket, one coupon, etc. Right? So it's completely data tech cohort driven. That's what we used to do then. But today once Shop Big Bazaar came in, once online grocery retail is happening, the industry is about what, six lakhs orders a day, just purely grocery online daily essential shopping, right? We do about fifty thousand orders a day. So so the challenge here is and we are very Low value, high frequency. If I, if I move fashion outside, electronics outside, right? They're completely low value, high frequency, right? So, as much as finding newer channels of acquiring customer, retaining them is more important because grocery shopping is probably twice a day. You want fruits and vegetables once in two days, right? Maybe like once in three days tops. So, you do like you know, two day shopping, you do weekly shopping, you do fortnightly shopping, and you do like, you know, your massive grains and like you know larger items that you do from a COP point of view, from a monthly or two monthly quarter point of view, right? So there are different levels of shopping from a consumer behavior point of view, and all these ladies are extremely, extremely great at this, right? So how do we not only get one fight the unorganized retail, get someone like you know 
sitting on our ranchi lucknow ranga reddy for example right move to from kerala to one organized retail right move to our channel from there what kind of and this purely not the fear of greed right on, on one side from an insurance point of view we cannot you cannot talk to consumer and stuff here because it's so necessary so important so right now it's very very impossible right you're not going to wait for days or like you know it's it's not a high it's a very perishable item like from a daily sense point of view and the thought process is different right but the loyalty is very very high at least for an organized retail point you can buy something from a couple of like you know buying milk from a grocer or a nature grocer or something like that right you would continue to buy that it's a habitual thing right but that's only if you move from kirana to on a shop right so i have to move wide in industry wide in to move from organ organized to organized retail from organized retail how do i keep holding on frequencies that the person buys month on month on month or day on day on day right every day of sorts right so data cohort segmentation are very important for also chances of acquisition right today we have social platforms and affiliate and couple of platforms that we look at but of course it's a challenge of how do we get people to come into the system get adapted to it right? it's very it's very uh, adaptability agility, agility is very important for us to get into the system right then hold on to them what do i keep offering to you like at the end of the day if i talk about big bazaar i get offering you can't have it something like right? what else can i tell you like every day go mother to to a mother who runs the house runs the ship there and um, so pricing value experience is more important right so that that's the battle we fight uh and they know the price is so well any kind of offer they know that the annual price is change one rupee a kilo it's that hard like you know for if you're buying a car if you're buying any other commodity any other product any other service services very difficult to talk about but any other product you won't know the price fluctuations right but if i tell my mother oil 300 rupees a liter she's like it was 290 last week so so it is so price value concentrated right we have to be ensure that one rupee matters because we come from very above a point of view or making what you want point of view right but someone sitting in aligarh musafir nagar right any of these cities right you know it's vital for them because that one rupee accumulated across every second day of shopping becomes a big thing in their life right so how do we understand that? and and we want to give it back to consumers as much as we can like right? you know it's 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 just about Giving it back, therefore, the deepest discounts, the deepest value offerings, just give it back money, and that's when loyalty and cashbacks are important. Or it's a very, very important as much, right? We have our retention game, or we keep thriving our retention game much more than uh, so. The f- if I would say focus, of course, importance of CAC cost and where do we get it from is as important. But we focus a lot on keeping them with us. Because loyalty, cashback is very important in the industry that we come from. Yeah, I have observed that you know, we use price, and this is perhaps one of the unique uh, categories where you are using price discovery for both acquisition and retention. Hundred percent. Right? So, and then especially around important days like fifteenth August or festivals, right? So right. Absolutely, stuff like that. And you also have to worry about every day dealing with apps like a TV share, for example. Hundred percent. <laughs> So it's a it's a very tough category to be in. Yeah, I mean, you, you of course you have your like you know uh, your coupon websites that right? yes. you know who've been doing deals in a certain way. But I don't think anyone really thought that you know you could use coupons or or these vouchers, for example, to buy groceries. Right? Like That's we true. tried something in Jan called Subsidy Subsidy, which is one of our flagship uh, properties. I would say some brand in itself, right? Where we offered someone that you buy uh, a voucher. You worth twenty five hundred, and you can just go to the store or buy online. Worth three thousand. We've never, we've never thought. I don't think it's an instant. Probably an industry first where you pre book your daily essentials or you pre book your shopping. Right, you pay worth twenty five hundred and get three thousand worth this. Right, we just tried and it was success. To just to understand what the consumer is thinking. Like you know, can I if I'm driving value immediately, right? If I'm giving you immediate value in terms of. A purchase will a mother respond to it? Will a like will a house runner respond to it in terms of buying something, right? So, so retention and then having them spend more and then from there it's the the challenge from there is cross selling, up selling, moving categories. Like, so 
that that's where we go from there. Thanks, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Sushant. I work with Project Life Insurance. And uh, I, I understand there's a third person. So, uh, I, I will try and speak a little bit as well from a general insurance side because that uh, represents a slightly different flavor uh, in the end scheme of things. Uh, as as, as uh, Satyat has mentioned, our industry is uh, can be summarized as, you know, it is not an impulse process. It's a long life cycle of purchase, not, 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 uh, uh, not, not, it, it goes in uh, days or weeks sometimes, right? Uh, people don't get up in the morning and say, Chalo, what insurance is right? Uh, that, 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 if that happens, we have uh, The products are uh, also not, not really standardized as such, which, which, which creates another uh, flavor. Uh, the most one of the most interesting challenges is, uh, it, it is a delayed gratification, if at all. Like, like, like news, okay, I, I read the news, I liked it, I did not like it, it is the end of a story, to a large extent, right? Uh, if, if it is a protection plans, what the, the customer wishes, I never use it. I, my, my family never needs to use it. Uh, even if it is a savings plan, for example, uh, it, it, it runs into 10, 15 years. Uh, and uh, somehow, uh, almost the entire setup has managed across, uh, not the insurance setup, but the entire ecosystem has gone towards a instant gratification to an extent that, you know, groffers and, and some other people are promising 10 minute deliveries, right? And, and we are at the other extreme. Uh, of, of course, these are some of the challenges that we do face. Uh, a lot of insurance companies also were established 15, 20 years ago, so quite, quite, quite a good amount of legacy exists there. Though there are a, a couple of them who have, uh, especially in the general insurance, who have come in the last uh, few years. Uh, but there are some advantages that we have, uh, in, especially in customer acquisition. Uh, I, I, I think a lot of, almost all the uh, market players would definitely be interested in what is this customer's income. We are in a very, very interesting situation. The customer tells us, this is my income. Okay, like, like uh, maybe Future or maybe Amazons, they may want to run models. Oh, this might be a range of the customer income, right? We, we are actually privy to that information. We are also privy to a lot of other information, uh, the, the family size, uh, who all in the family, what all do they do, etc. So, to an extent, we have a very interesting and a different set of rich data that we might get. And, and uh, certainly some, some insurance companies use it, some of them have started uh, using it right now uh, to enhance the customer acquisition perspective, from, from that perspective, right? We may go to a very different extreme and at the start understand, oh, this customer has arbitrary example three to five lakhs of income per year, we should actually pitch something that is very, very customizable and, and uh, can give a decently smooth onboarding process to that customer compared to a, a, compared to a 15 to 20 lakh uh, income customer. Uh, these, these are some of the interesting advantages that happen. But of course, uh, technology plays a very, very different role here. Uh, a lot of people come from a direct-to-customer background, right? Uh, a future retail or, or even you, even HDFC securities, etc. In insurance, we also have a huge uh, agency uh, advisor selling, right? Uh, and uh, those those advisors uh, may, may may typically not be, you know, college graduates or or may not be MBAs, uh, etc. Of the world, uh, but they have. Uh, but, but they have, you know, over the years risen through the ranks, so as to say. Uh, from a new customer acquisition perspective, it is also very interesting how do we help those people make, make, make the right deals. And at some point of time, insurance, life insurance was particularly uh, notorious sort of for a small amount of mis-selling, right? Now with technology coming in and with a sort of visibility that uh, 
the company gets around that. We can, to a large extent, understand if there is a gross mis-selling, if, if, if things are going ahead properly or not. And uh, why this is important is because of the retention uh, perspective that comes in. Right? So, from that perspective, we are also able to help our distributors, our, our advisors and, and so on and so forth. Make the right deals, take, uh, help customer make the right decisions. Uh, so that ultimately the trust of a customer increases either on the advisors or on the company. But, but as, as Satyarth has said, uh, loyalty towards insurance companies uh, has, has a long way to go. Right? Uh, very, very low engagement. Uh, oh, correct. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you, raise a, you raised a very important point in terms of <coughs> the frequency of uh, interaction with customers. We'll come to that later. Uh, we have a new person who's joined the panel. Can you please introduce yourself? Hi. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm Meghna. I work with UTI Mutual Funds, and I am here in place of Gaurav Suri. So, yes. Sorry, I was late. No, no. Please go ahead. So. Basically, what we are talking about. Question with her. Probably we can bring in the concept of omni-channel engagement. Yeah, so they, that's what I was coming to next. Absolutely. So, <laughs> if, if I'm not wrong, in February or March, uh, you had introduced uh, interacting with customers through WhatsApp channel. If I'm not right, like, uh, is it like omni-channel? How those communications have been centralized? If the customer reach out from some other channel, like, right, is it giving a multi touch channel experience or are you working on an omni channel experience? What are the best practices probably you have followed? How did you adapt to it? Because it's pretty new and most of the brands are almost very much, you know, interested in engaging with their customers through WhatsApp, right, and helping them through WhatsApp because that is instantaneous, right? Uh, so, if you can throw some light around that, that would be really helpful for us. Thank you. So, yeah, I think we have started WhatsApp. Uh, but, but WhatsApp as a channel for now, and yeah, interestingly, yesterday I was in a discussion which was talking about omni-channel experience for customers. So I won't say it's omni-channel as yet. We are working towards it. It's multi-channel, uh, all channels are interconnected. We do see direct conversations coming into WhatsApp. We see conversations from social media posts coming into WhatsApp. Uh, we see a lot of emailers getting redirected and opened into WhatsApp. So yeah, it's it's uh, multifold. Our SMS, email, social media, direct communication, MFT channels are also very very uh, open to WhatsApp now. So that's that's made life a little easier for us because communication is instant with MFTs. Um, other than that, WhatsApp is still looked at as a channel of uh, support. Uh, customers are re reaching to ask. Most of the top three queries are. How do I do this? Where do I go and get my NAV details? How do I check my statement of account? So it's more um, informational yet and not so much transactional while we have seen transactions going up slowly and steadily. And we are constantly evolving our journeys because we are monitoring what customers are doing on different channels and replicating it on WhatsApp. Another interesting thing that we have done on WhatsApp is um, we, we understand that India as a market has the need of a personal touch. So just a machine sending or throwing uh, pre-fed answers doesn't necessarily solve the problem for the customers. So we have integrated live agents from our contact center into our WhatsApp. So same as the chatbot. And that's also something that's getting picked up very well and getting received well. So yeah, that's how we are trying to bring omni channel because contact center being one touch point which has all the information when customer calls and or writes an email our chat and whatsapp also rolling up onto contact center including social response management uh, we are moving towards it but yeah it's currently multi touch it's not omni channel yet I, I, I will take uh, and uh, we, we spoke about how insurance is a very, very low engagement after the purchase, right? Uh, that a, a, a lot of you will have mobile apps. Typically, insurance companies have, don't have mobile apps, right? I, I, I don't know about Tata. We don't really focus on that. Uh, but sooner or later, some, some analyst will ask, where is your mobile app? Uh, low engagement, probably once or twice a customer will come to us in a year. That too, maybe for uh, for for renewal, right? And we also face this challenge that how what what should we do about a mobile app? 
uh, we took a slightly different perspective. Uh, what we said is people will not use our mobile app, uh, but people do have a WhatsApp on, on their phones. So almost everybody has a WhatsApp. So why don't we uh, create our own app inside WhatsApp? And I'm not saying this technically, right? But as a matter of perspective, we, we are uh, we are saying that no, we will not probably make a mobile app unless there is a differentiated value to a customer. WhatsApp, to a large extent, is where our mobile app resides and we will uh, utilize WhatsApp uh, for all those services. So, so that's a slightly different perspective that we have taken. Correct. Yeah, actually, yeah, so all this leads to maybe a couple of things that, you know, very interestingly being pointed out here. Uh, <clears throat> one of the points that Tamita uh, touched upon was how it is important to know your customer even before they have come to your app. So, you know, the, the uh, <clears throat> because the users now have access or they are not restricted to a single point of interaction with your brand, right? It can come from anywhere. Uh, <clears throat> for example, even from the comp competition side in many categories. Uh, it's important for all businesses now to have a full view of the customer, right? A 360 degree view, uh, especially in say an online, offline experience like retail, but uh, <clears throat> Amitabh, uh, just tell us, uh, how do you go about doing that in terms of, you know, because you have a legacy business which is print, which many people predicted will die, which is, you know, still growing in, in our country. And what are the challenges you face in your business when it comes to, you know, either converting legacy uh, users to digital or acquiring fresh digital users and how do you sort of make them adopt uh, the other products. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think the challenge uh, uh, has not been as much from the user's perspective mm -hmm. than the content creators. <coughs> right. So the uh, challenge has been and is even today, I think for the, and I think so, honestly speak that for the entire industry, is to bring about a change in which the editors or the reporters, uh, especially the senior ones, the good ones, uh, how to adapt them uh, to write in the form which is most suitable for digital format. That is, uh, uh, that's a very, very big challenge that we face. Uh, even today, many of us, we, we, are, we are living in the digital world, more and more of us is sitting here. But at, at many given point of time, we wouldn't like to read a, a 5 to 10 pages article in digital or a mobile rather than in a magazine or a listing. So, uh, as she was mentioning, you know, something like news and shots is something that interested me. So the format of consumption has changed completely and it is changing at a pace which is uh, it's very difficult to keep up with. So the formats came from uh, a large format news reporting to a shorter format, from a shorter format news reporting to videos <coughs> and uh, you know, graphics, videos and so it's, it's, it's very difficult for uh, someone who's used to of actually going into depth and you know uh, being very analytical, giving the views to put the bring it that into let's say thousand words or two thousand words. Correct. So that's a that is one very very that's the biggest challenge that I think our industry faces. Coming to your question uh, from the consumer point of view. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I think uh, we as marketers would, uh, we have to work on niche and uh, that is why again coming back to my own point that I have mentioned earlier, uh, we, uh, the, the universe is extremely big, it's extremely big and it's extremely large. So we need to understand the need of the consumer, we need to understand and match it with our products and services and then compare to, you know, engage them or to purchase them. Uh, that is what the whole idea is. 
So coming back, what we do is we try and we, we are trying to, I don't say we do it very well right as of now, but yes, we have started that journey and it has given us some good results. Uh, we are trying to analyze digital footprints. So the, I think the biggest advantage of digital marketing has been that uh, uh, earlier all the marketers used to work on psychographics, demographics, uh, you know, the print, a little bit from we went to be able to a little bit with television. Digital has brought it directly to behavioral segmentation. And we are able to target consumers right on the behavioral aspect. So while um, psychographic economically I may be uh, I may, I can buy a Blackberry. This is what we used to think earlier. But I may not be comfortable in using the email on my mobile. Behaviorally, I might not be the target audience for you. Right? So it's extremely important to understand um, what the individual behavior is. And uh, yeah, so AI really helps us to understand digital footprints of individuals. Okay, and then you segment them accordingly and then maybe yes. provide so we content as part. So, and, uh, uh, yeah. So there are a lot of things uh, which you cannot, uh, you don't, you, know, you should not be doing it ethically. Uh, so there are ways to understand where people actually. So uh, yeah, this is I think one point which we must all, uh, must have all experience. Uh, there is an age bracket from 40 plus and uh, uh, less than 40. While we who are you know, 40 plus still think that we should not give all our information, uh, we, we want to be a little uh, conservative in sharing our information, we are not born in that digital world, the internet world. I am noticing that youngsters don't have a problem with that. They are born in the Google society. So correct, uh, correct, that correct. makes a lot of difference when it comes to you know acquiring young consumers and understanding youngsters. Uh, as your audience comparatively to the younger ones. So Correct, and I think the cycle of gratification, as you mentioned, has yeah. really impacted your industry the most. Yeah, right. they need instant news, and you're you're competing with a daily hunt or an in shorts, for example, which are aggregated models and yes. uh, are not even creating their own content, for example. So I think that that has been kind of an advantage to content creators yeah. for distribution, the, yeah. because they are only increasing our universe. Correct. So ultimately we end up making, uh, increasing our reach, making more money out of it. Uh, so aggregators are kind of, a, I would say, uh, like the channels uh, you have, the more, more number of agents that you have in the insurance sector, the better for you. So aggregators are actually not, uh, we, I won't say that they are competitors, they are more of a partner. Good, thanks. I Can I just throw it a point? Sorry, go for it. So since you mentioned about this, Eighty-four percentage of the CMO says they are finding challenging, like getting the right business insight, like according to the Bain and Insights. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And eighty-four percentage are saying they cannot effectively target and segment the right users because the insights are not there. Is, is it true? Like, or what kind of challenges prevailing when we do these kind of uh, behavior? There, are, well, I think uh, first and foremost is uh, are we actually asking the right questions to ourselves mm. as marketers? Yeah? <laughs> Uh, I think that is a very, very important thing, how we are trying to segment it. Uh, so are we, uh, are we analyzing the financial uh, status of an individual and then targeting them with the product? Or are we actually understanding the behavioral aspects and targeting with the product? Uh, so uh, I think uh, what we have noticed is that behavior actually helps us a lot as compared to the financial aspects. So, uh, uh, let me just come back to a little bit. So, we, when I am trying to help my advertisers uh, make a better, uh, you know, get, get more ROI from whatever they have invested with us, we have noticed that when we are targeting uh, behaviorally, uh, the ROIs are extremely healthy. So, in the, uh, <laughs> as uh, Sandeep sir, sir was saying, you know, uh, frankly, this industry has been doing extremely well that we have all uh, read about how they have uh, grown. What challenge that we have seen other people come up is that uh, with 
new international players coming in without any uh, regulatory controls like a uh, no more uh, anything you know they for him to advertise he is bounded by so many regulations he will have to mention you cannot invest like this you should not be doing this there is a lot of international companies that are coming up and luring people without any regulations right that is where we realize that uh, the uh, when you are behaviorally segmenting and reaching out to that audience when you understand your audience better the ROIs are extremely high Got it. and uh, I don't know uh, I'm sorry <laughs> I'm being a little long here as you mentioned about WhatsApp that you're using creating a WhatsApp that's a very interesting aspect uh, don't you think that uh, how, how that is going to help you with your environment in the ORM as such if it's directly on the web rather than the WhatsApp I don't know. That's a question that I think easily yeah. I present to answer. <laughs> Interesting point. Uh, which brings me to you, Sandeep. Uh, you know, in any category which is booming, you know, it's obviously going to attract a lot of competition. But at the same time, the offering that you have is very regulated and constrained. So, and it is going to be delivered over the same, you know, six or seven inches of a screen. How do you differentiate uh, in this environment and how do you sort of, uh, you know, retain your customers and how do you compete? Because uh, a Zeroda or a Samco or somebody else who has no legacy, you know, behind them suddenly can come as a platform and offer similar services. So while uh, all these people, uh, the new age brokers or the e-commerce, uh, you know, the or the companies uh, who are very nimble in, uh, in uh, the technology have acquired customers. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, people are making money. Uh, they're serving the purpose, as uh, I said. Uh, not exactly, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you don't know the what is under the skin, right? Because uh, we come out with research calls. We, we mean, uh, we, we mean uh, to be able to give a value add to the customer. Right? We give research calls and tell them uh, that this is what you should be doing right? with adequate stop losses and, uh, and the targets. So that's the difference we have made and we will we'll stick to our business. This has, there has been a business model. We, we, we value add to people. Uh, we would not like to go to Jasmeet and uh, give him the uh, tool and uh, let him play with it, especially so because uh, he doesn't uh, know what is to be done. A right? lot of people are have come on to equity, not only equity bandwagon, uh, people have gone on to futures and options, trade. Okay. Yeah. Right? Without understanding what happens uh, and how to place a trade and, and uh, what happens. So, not so while the numbers are in, enormous, that doesn't mean people are making money. Mm -hmm. You would have uh, heard very high uh, level sources from these players only saying that less than one person people make money in futures and options. Mm -hmm. right? So we are happy sticking uh, to uh, to what we've been doing because we bring we believe we bring value. Okay. We value add to people. They may learn from us and place a trade uh, in some other uh, app that is their call. We can't restrict that. Yes. But uh, we'll stick to our business. We have a large brand uh, brand legacy. We'll not we cannot dilute it. Cannot dilute it. Right? Let me put it this way. So we'll never go, go on to some business which is. Uh, which doesn't hold value. Right? So it's a long term play you're saying and you have to be basically be prepared for the long haul and stick to the values that you know. Even, even because after the advent of such uh, players, there, yes. there has been a massive uh, undercutting. Yes. Right? Yeah. In terms of uh, the, the pricing, Fees. pricing and all. We, yeah. we have survived, we have done well. Yeah. Why is that? People are still coming to us, people are still. Uh, you mentioned about Google Ads uh, and the, or, or, I mean, uh, the open market sourcing, which is oligopol uh, this oligopolized or localized. Yes. I mean, uh, so we still uh, are attracting customers. Why are they coming to us? I think a lot to do with trust that your brand is built. Yes. yes. We stick to it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Interestingly, I will, I will on, on the research part, 
that is very interesting. Recently, I got an email from uh, one of the securities companies, and they, they they had their skin entirely in the game. The email just said, two months ago, we had asked you or recommended to invest in these ten stocks. Okay, whatever whatever the number is. After two months, we are actually telling you that out of our recommendations. 65 whatever percentage a decent percentage for me at least did go up and uh, you know that is that is where the proof of the pudding is right that that is what he says na, ke, uh, anybody can come put money etc 11 12 percent make money but if i get an email like this or if i get a message like this my trust suddenly goes up As, assuming that i am not a savvy investor and all that uh, which I assume is a, a, a large percent of the market, right? My trust suddenly goes up, and I will be I will be looking forward to another emailer. Baba recommend me some stocks, right? So that 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 part is very interesting for me. Thanks. So the other interesting point that is emerging from this is that uh, depending on the frequency of interaction that your customers have with your business impacts your digital strategy and your retention strategy which directly impacts what we commonly know as uh, you know, lifetime value. I think, and given the current circumstances, I think it's become central to the entire business per se, any digital business that you run, or any form of digital business that you run. Uh, and we have, you know, varying businesses here. So, uh, what I would like to understand is that, how is this factor of interaction with customer frequency affecting your you know lifetime value strategies you know how do you plan uh, acquisition we've heard from all of you how do you therefore plan your engagement and retention to increase the you know lifetime value you know uh, maybe you guys can you know both from the digital side can tell us uh, your re relatively high frequency uh, usage so you guys can enlighten us on how it impacts your day-to-day -day, uh, planning and execution. Okay, so for uh, I'm audible. Yeah. Yeah. So for us, uh, frequency yes, it's important. Uh, we kind of try and segment our users uh, with respect to the uh, the journeys that they have had on our app. Uh, say, for example, there are there would be a set of users who only use the app for tracking where the bus is. Then there might be uh, one particular set of users who would use uh, for transaction only for say a single journey ticket. Uh, dividing the other set into uh, people who are regularly using the buses, uh, also using uh, say a mobile pass or a monthly pass or a weekly pass. Uh, and then tracking their journeys on how frequently they are engaging with us. Uh, the idea is if we can get them to come back to app more and more. So if, uh, say for example, somebody is using only for live tracking, and uh, if we study the entire segment and their journeys and figure out, say one particular route has a high uh, frequency of buses into, uh, say on weekends, so I'll give you one example. In Jabalpur, uh, there, there are two routes, which has high frequency only on Sunday which is actually the day when lesser number of buses run. And uh, while we went and studied uh, the other consumers and how they uh, interact with uh, Chalo, we realized that uh, Jabalpur is like a temple city. There is some Kuli river, Narbada river is there. So as a behavioral pattern, people over there, on a Sunday, it's like a picnic spot. People go, visit, come back. And bus being the primary mode, they are not ready to commit uh, for a monthly uh, commitment to the bus. It's not like uh, they travel every day, but there's a huge chunk that only travels on Sunday. So then how do we create customized product uh, for each particular segment and how do we communicate it to them so that it makes them feel that this is personalized for me. Right. And just to add on to what uh, he was also mentioning, uh, even bus travel, like a daily travel, it's a cost uh, sensitive matter. So uh, even a one rupee, two rupee saving on a day 
creates a huge push for somebody to go and commit their weekly travel because other than food, travel is the second uh, most thought after and spent daily travel where people uh, kind of put their energies into. So two, three things, try and uh, customize and segment, create cohorts uh, in a way that define uh, how people travel or how they interact with Chalo generally sure. for what product and how do we communicate to each particular segment to try and get them more. Right. So, so product usage based product segmentation. Product usage based, time spent, yeah. Right. So this travel from Exactly. So I, I think the only answer to that of how do we mention, how do we understand uh, lifetime value and it's, I think it's just cohorts, 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 right, you know, we, that's, that's all we do. So, for example, uh, just as a point, so, so we have two flagship, uh, as, as the brand, we have two flagship properties, one is Sapsi Sastidin, which comes in Jan and Mahabachat, which comes in August, right, a certain percentage of our audience only come to us twice a year, but they hold up, they hold up, they buy six months of stuff. That's because, and this is again cities, cities we haven't seen, cities, if everyone's travelled here and done consumer groups, you realize that smaller cities, they just hold up, they come and hold up for six months and that's what we anyway do, that because there's a six month shopping that is there, right? So that's one set of audience, right? And the other one is weekly, monthly, topping, etc., right? So it's, it's also, understand consumer behaviour and data, they don't lie. They give us a lot more sense than what we have in ourselves, right? So when they tell us, we check what percentage of bills have increased, what what are the attach rates. So if we run a program called Wednesday Bazaar, it's also a property that it's offline, but we run something where we give, for example, onion for one rupee a kilo, right? It's, it's you don't expect that, it's pure onion and one rupee is a kilo, right? That helps in bringing your audience because it's a steel price or a repeat purchase. With that, what's the attach rate for the other products? Or for on that day, what is the attach rate of onion? Right? So. That's, that's, and then we, we know that if it's worked, not worked, that's the way we retain saying the attach rate or the bill size or the order value, etc. right? What's increased, what's not increased, right? So till we don't understand cohort, like, you know, if he's bought milk last time, has he also bought bread? Why isn't he not buying bread, right? Or if he's bought fruits and vegetables, because fundamentally our challenge, uh, if you go to a store, if you go to a, is, is if you buy groceries, if your cart is full of groceries, right, or just food, staples, HPC, consumer products, etc. Inherently, you don't feel like fa uh, shopping fashion. You don't, with, with that cart, in, in, a, in a physical world, right, or digital world now, you don't end up shopping fashion, right? So, how do we then cross that? But we are the only retailer where in that cart, you can have a trimmer, you can have a TV, you can have like you know your inner way you can have a pomegranate you can have onion you can have milk in that same cart right so it's it's also omni channel shopping in one way right but for that i have to really know what's the person been buying right what's his bill size like how much has he always spent with us what are the frequency of him coming back or what is he always bought is he only buying like certain things with us if you only buying weekly shopping with us as we move him from then the, for that cohort we move, we play with only low value high frequencies. For another segment, we upsell and make him, make the person buy a higher category, right? Or a different category. Why hasn't the person who's consistently buying with us, like, you know, we run something like a golden, silver, platinum program of sorts, right? Someone who's bought with us four times, five times, six times, like, has the bill purchase, has the bill value increased? If it's not increased, has the categories increased? Has the attach rates of other products that we've promoted on increased, right? Do we see any digression? of any kind of offer you run, right? So it's it's purely, purely cohorts and they don't lie. They give us a lot of science and I think we learn a lot more from consumer. One is behavior and one is just data telling us. So right? I think it's, it's, it's also a factor of the size of catalog that you run, right? You have the luxury absolutely. of, you have the luxury of iterating based on uh, attach rates or loss leaders, for example. 100%. So that's interesting. But, uh, you know, so in your category, for example, you don't have the luxury of a very large catalog. So, uh, how do you manage that? Yep, thanks. Yeah, while he was answering, I was just thinking of the same thing in my head. Um, 
So because everyone here spoke of data and um, the need for understanding the data to understand what the consumers are saying to us with their different behavior and um, their different attributes, uh, right? I think I just want to take this question uh, in two parts. One is we spoke of engagement and then we spoke of retention, right? So where is the engagement coming from? Engagement is not necessarily limited to my own medium like my website, my app, right? It, it is coming from wherever and it, it might come from Google My Business listing for all I know. It might come from uh, my app store review. It might come from social media comments and mention. It might come, let's say, from a CV post where somebody has written about us, right? So as such, how well and efficiently are we managing and monitoring all these channels uh, makes it critical for any business today in a digital world, not just ours, to help us understand what the consumers are talking about in an open world, which is not a closed do door conversation with the brand itself directly. So that is one key point where engagement uh, needs to be monitored and managed with the consumers because you're also painting a broader picture to a larger audience, it's open to all. Second, uh, again, engagement within uh, your own medium, as I said, is something that you will have to break down and understand who is my repeat audience, who are the audiences who have come from my uh, MFTs, my distributors, who are the uh, customers who have come through my branches and bank partners, who are the consumers who have come from aggregators like Grow and ET Money, right? So there are multiple such other channels, even closed doors. So these are very, very segmented. So third thing would be to understand consumers within your website, your direct customers, as you call it. So customers who are coming to your website and investing, customers who are going to your app and investing, uh, which is very limited again for mutual fund. So bringing all of these together, uh, understanding what consumers are buying from Grow, what consumers are buying through you directly, what consumers are asking for and then crafting a communication around it and uh, yeah I think similar to what they have been doing creating nudges within the investment journey creating nudges within the touch points is what we are actively working towards. Okay, okay that, that's interesting. So Paddy how are we doing on time? Yep so yeah. How are we doing on time? Are we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. like, just like five minutes more. That's okay. it. Then so, twelve o'clock we can break for the lunch. Great. So, I think I have asked all the questions that were. Yeah, probably on. since you talk yeah. a lot about loyalty, so yes. I just want to understand a few factors because. Uh, so one of the past discussions, uh, you know, focus group discussions. So this gentleman, the chief data officer from Matahari, the famous chain in Indonesia department. So, they mentioned uh, sixty percentage of the revenue has been driven by loyalty program. So that takes to a fact that how are we measuring the loyalty program? What are the best practices are we taking when we consider to the market? We I mean, share your revenue plan, but we are more interested around the best practices, right? So if you can share some insights around that, then post that we can close and break for the lunch. I think no, 100%, right? It's said most of the audience, at least, especially if it's daily essentials and stuff, like, you know, you, you need it consistently, right? Like, you know, uh, so loyalty, cashbacks, coupons is is a massive, massive part of our complete digital strategy. Right? We run, we have, we have a wallet called Future Pay, right? Uh, through which uh, it it helps you pay across any Future Group chain, any any kind of uh, store or online purchase, right? So loyalty for us is is uh, for a consumer. It we want to drive maximum, give out maximum value, right? So it's it's cashback, and I know it's going to come back. The challenges, there the challenges uh, twofold, right? One is whatever cashback you give across for any industry, right? Whether it's retail, consumer goods, right? Will the person just use that much? That's the fear. Like, what's the kind of uplift, right? If I give you a five to be coupon, right? Go to the store, go to any store, pick up. The brand owner would talk about how much would you, would you only buy 500 worth of, see 501. We've had cases where if you're given 100 rupee cash back in your wallet, people have bought 101. Utna, right? Or bought 110 rupees, bought one pair of socks worth 110 and gone back home. Right? So there's of course bleeding there. There's of course like 
but that's also understanding what sort of cohorts are doing this right so the other set also then is and because this is this for some people or for some audience because they do could do it consistent in terms of purchase right it also becomes a sort of drug that you it's, it's a gratification that you earn this cashback right or a lot and you keep doing this right so somewhere it's also personalized and because it's personalized because it's gratified because you earned it achieved it right you keep going and buying and using it somewhere or the other right so it's a, it's a massive uh, it is it it's not very important pillars to hold person back and consistently be in your system through this right that's where we bring in value in terms of effective pricing right that that's one bit that's the way i can say okay i'm breaking down my margins so that i can have you back in the system for a long period of time and that's the ultimate lifetime value it's not just once twice because for us lifetime value is not once twice the it's, it's it's possibly endless right because it, you need it's see it's it's also the it's also the beauty of the category right insurance once a year twice a year tops right like ironic ironically right? for us it's it's every day you need this every day right you need to have cash back or loyalty program every day right so there is also breaking down of data and understanding this right so that's what it is but of course uh, again it's consumer tells you everything consumer's behavior just tells you everything right so that's what it is i also wanted to address one point before when you mentioned uh, the challenge being content creators uh, adapting to the digital medium right but i think i just digress that from from a consumption consuming habit right you have whether it's reading or viewing one set of audience consumes thumb chopping content which is 3 second content right where where the onus is on the brand to have a great brand story 3 seconds you sell me sell me in terms of engagement or sell me in terms of whatever actionability you want me to do right but that doesn't top or hasn't stopped brands or creators to create 3 minute beautiful films right twitter was always there as a news medium and now probably a support medium right i mean just in terms of people wanting out of support systems etc and it's still one of the fastest news mediums out there right but that didn't stop in shots being around right but while in shots is there which gives me news that hasn't stopped me reading my editorial whether it's et or hbr with the longest time like 15 20 minutes half an hour So I think it's also the onus on the brand in to break down the usage of consumption into not news but in terms of leisure news towards uh, deep reading news, right? And then break down, and then it's also personalization, right? Whether you've been only consuming editorial articles or whether you've been only consuming news, which is just snippets of just what's happening out there, right? So I think if we create great brand stories and create content which is personalized to such with time spent from a new, from a news point of view i think time spent is one of the largest metrics the most important metrics from my point of view you can break it down to like you know helping creator create according etc but it's it's i think it's a beautiful set of problems we all have shared and i always feel bad uh, sort of uh, with the insurance figure is so regulated or banking finance bfsi is always so regulated it's always beautiful to understand uh, what we can go through and i think everyone has their own challenges so yeah Okay thanks. Yeah sure. So yeah, you are absolutely well put you know. The challenge is because uh, the demand from the market is growing. It's not about the challenge of creating the content because the content had been created long time and adapting to the varied demand that you have. Yeah. That and it is changing at a pace which is very difficult to catch. Very difficult to catch. But to make content there is a lot of manpower man hours required behind you know the market uh, so i had an argument with uh, google with about a year back uh, when they were initiating their gni product in india uh, so they were saying that no you have to just uh, you know probably some person has to just give us an api feed it's a 15 minutes job to give an api feed so that you know we will start sharing the content now the price is what about creating that content that is where the time is required the manpower the effort everything is behind creating the content not giving the api feed so that's the whole thing so ultimately if you are if, if suppose there is a simple news that has happened let's talk about covid there 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 will be readers who will be We want to go into in-depth analysis, analytics as to you know what is in the trend, how it is going, how it is, what who has said what, 
will be people who just want to read this methods. There will be people who want to see a longer video. There will be people, someone who will be want to see a shorter video. It's uh, you know at times even we used to feel that uh, we can cut you know edit the longer format into a shorter format, and it, but it doesn't work. You have to customize content for everybody. Yeah, that poses a huge challenge. If content is still king, I think now slowly packaging. And distribution yeah, of it is becoming as good as King or Ace. That's exactly what I think that you cannot make a longer content and package into smaller formats. It doesn't work that way. It's not working. No, you have to create it. You have to create it separately. Yeah, of course. Great. I think some great insights. And, you know. Uh, so I think in 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 summary, I think what has come, uh, what I at least comes to my mind is that yes, uh, consumers have adopted digital in a big way, but that has also resulted uh, in a big challenge which is from a share of mind problem, you have now share of time problem and each one of us in any business has to basically you know, buy for the same buy of time, depending on the frequency of usage and necessity and requirement. And I think everybody has their own you know, challenges uh, in this new world and we hope that you know we can uh, partner with all of you and you know help you to sort of engage with these you know customers more productively, help you retain them and therefore you know uh, create better lifetime value. So with that, I would like to call it a wrap and thank you again for your time and you know valuable inputs. Uh, we can now sort of uh, break for lunch and you know, take. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead.